Hi, I'm Aisha Howie, and I'm part of the Bronx Teen Council, and we brought in Genesee today to talk about activism, and since we're talking about civic engagement, we thought that she would be a perfect person to talk about more of the topic. Hi, I'm Genesee, and I am really glad to be here with you guys talking to you about activism and civic engagement, getting involved, and you know, you guys want to know how to get involved, so I'm really excited to talk about that with you guys today. So I was actually a member of Teen Council myself about four years ago, it was my junior year of high school. I had a great time in Teen Council then, so it's really cool to be back with you guys. What will you say to inspire others to go on the good fight per se? you know just not feeling like everything needs to be so like intellectualized like we can have simple basic conversations about like how we feel about things and the changes that need to be done so as far as advocating for political change what has been your biggest challenge there's definitely a lot of scary aspects to activism a lot of it is very intimidating because just like how we was talking about before it seems like a lot of people within these groups and communities they're so much smarter and they're so much more confident and they're better speakers and whatnot don't hold back like I definitely wouldn't be as involved as I was today if I didn't just reach out you know I learned a lot from a lot of these people that I thought were so much smarter than me and now I'm just having normal basic conversations and I'm not afraid to talk anymore you know what I mean so um how do you balance a uh, social life and you being politically active I think that definitely might be one of the biggest challenges when it comes to activism because activism can be extremely consuming and I guess also as a woman of color and as a queer person, so much of activism is essentially just fighting for my right and the rights of others to just be people and to just be human. Just let me be who I am. Regarding like having a social life, just checking in with your friends. Cause I guess when it comes to activism, like activism is your social life. Like all of my friends are activists in their own way, even if they're not like planning protests or going to meetings and reaching out to a lot of people. Do you know what I mean? Everything is just about like the next move and how you can continue reaching out to people and just sort of like growing together and continuing to reach towards progress. But it's nice. I like that. Like, I like that me and all of my friends, we just always want to be involved and we're always thinking of new ways to do so. And we're always talking about ways to better ourselves and to be better people so that we can continue finding better ways to reach out to others and educating others and educating ourselves so that we can, like, it's just all about being the best person that you can possibly be. My name is Michael Paul Brito. I'm a visual artist, DJ, and an arts educator. What inspires me? Personal events, popular culture, race relations, class issues, marginalized communities, being a person of color. Question. All right, what is marginalized communities? Like, um... People who, people who are like grouped and treated this the same way, like for instance, 
Um, all of the guys who got profiled when they were stopping and frisking people, that would be a marginalized community. So I really like the, um, the white woman tears, mm -hmm. the, the piece, because um, white people in general, they have like a lot of power and privilege. Mm -hmm. And like, um, it happened recently where the white lady called on the family that was having a barbecue mm -hmm. and she just started crying mm -hmm. and she was, you know, oh, get them arrested or anything. And it's crazy to see that just like a woman getting absolutely nothing. She's not being disturbed or anything. She's the one being disturbed by the fact that they're having a nice mm -hmm. time. Okay, so like the white woman and the barbecue and like the two black guys getting arrested at uh, Starbucks just for sitting down, mm -hmm. how do you handle racial issues like how that? How do I handle it? How do you handle it in general? How should we handle it? I would just say like when that kind of stuff happens, what I do is I either start making some collages or I go out and try to make a video. And that's why, how I deal with it. Because if I tried to deal with every racial thing that happens to me, I would probably go crazy. So I put it into work and then let the work speak. Because I got stopped and frisked. And I was going to art galleries in Chelsea and I got stopped and frisked. And they said that I was going through the galleries too fast. I was going into the galleries and looking too fast. And then they said that... Um, I said that I was, I, I told them I was an artist because they wanted to know why I had so many cameras in my bag. They dumped my bag on the floor. They just dumped it, all my cameras and stuff. And they go, like, what are you doing with these cameras? I said, I'm an artist. I like, yeah, right. And that's, that really happened. And then I was so upset about it, I did a, a performance where I put a red carpet down near the High Line. And I, had, and I put out an open call and I told people to come if they were ever stopped and frisked to wear the outfit they were stopped and frisked in. And we did a stop and frisk fashion show. And I did a, I did a soundtrack to that. And we had like a stop and frisk fashion show in the meatpacking district. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it was in front of the Diane von Furstenberg store. And it was during Art Not Places. And we drew, we drew a crowd, but it was also interesting to see people like were wondering what we were doing. And people were like, also like, damn, that's messed up. So, and it also, I felt like I felt like part of something because everyone who showed up had been stopped and frisked. So I felt like, okay, so it's not just me. And it was so. so those are the kind of ways that I deal with it. And then, I mean, you could deal with it that way, but I'm just saying, like, if you ever get stopped, the best thing for you to do is to whatever they ask you to do to do it, and like, don't put yourself in harm's way. Just you know, because. I don't know. It just always seems to end bad. And then it's like nothing ever comes out of it. Hi, my name is Shaleen Rodriguez. You guys already know that I'm a contemporary artist. I co-run a space called Take Back the Bronx. And we are radical community activists and we do work around housing and anti-police brutality and political education. As being like an activist, um, do you see like colonization like nowadays and how do you feel about it? It's in my practice. It's probably the thing that is connected to my art practice and my activism, right? Is this, this act of decolonization. Because hip hop itself is a decolonizing act. It takes what's around itself and samples and remixes and creates a new. And I think that it's very powerful. I would just like you to elaborate on what these strategies of survival are in the political sphere and how things like systematic oppression and institutionalized slavery contribute to our need to survive. Me sitting here holding this microphone talking to you could be a strategy of survival. This conversation is a strategy of survival. Um, whenever we are ducking in dark corners to talk about things that are important, those are all things that I consider strategies of survival. Because of institu institutionalized racism, because of the prison industrial complex. So how we're able to put two and four and six people together to um, think underneath the layers of institutions to get our art out, to get our word out, to, um, to take us to the next level so that there's another generation that can sit around and do this. Those are, that's what I mean. Do you think politicians see our struggle and do you think that they're trying to help us? No. Okay. Yes, but no. Yes, they see our struggle. I think that uh, anyone who goes into politics starts off caring. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the structure that they are working in 
allows for them to do very little of what we need. What do you think is the best way for us to have our voices heard? Exhibitions of resistance are super important. Breaking the monotony is super important. So my question is, what is something we as a community or this generation can do better? Do you have to continue to be like sensitive and more emotionally aware? Do you have to continue making art? Like, How can we help take back the Bronx, basically? My advice is to, I mean, be humble. Know that you came from somewhere. Something came before you. You are standing on the shoulders of people who are standing on shoulders and of other people who are standing on shoulders, you know? Um, you guys already have something we don't have, which is that emotional intelligence, you know? We're, st we're learning from you. Hello, my name is Jacob Serras from the Bronx Museum Teen Summer Program. Today we'll be interviewing Shawnee Peters and Joseph Coulier. We run the Black School together. It's an experimental um, art school that combines Black radical politics with public art. We're based in Harlem and we usually do workshops, um, either one-day workshops or multi-week workshops, but turn it on the engagement where we teach radical black history through art making. My first question to you is, what is the inspiration behind creating the Black School? The inspiration behind the Black School comes from the freedom schools of the civil rights movement and the liberation schools of the Black Panther, Black Power movement. Do you have any challenges for people that are not engaged in the Black School? Um, yeah, it's sometimes it's difficult co-organizing people so we've been talking about uh, lately a lot about how to organize around things that people are already doing so um, dinners dance parties um, just like celebrating joy and celebrating black love so that people will be interested in taking up uh, political causes that that we're trying to promote can you list some political causes if you don't mind um, yeah, sure. So we just developed a card deck with, uh, that outlines a lot of the principles of the black school and by extension, black radical politics. There's a long list of things we're interested in, but we're doing work around anti-gentrification, um, decolonization of education, black feminism, mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, illustrating the role that black women play in liberation uh, work which is often like uh, relegated to the back. Oh, you like know? pushed away. Yeah, uh, or not spotlighted. Um, and various different causes that are affecting our communities. Hello, I am Victor Valley, and I'm here to interview. Shawnee Peters. It's nice to meet you. Um, what other um, mediums or art forms do you use during the black school? Uh -huh. Um, well, these are silk screens. These are my individual works. A lot of the things in this space are made by me and Joseph together, like the cards, the kind of overall design. What do you hope that the people who participate in a black school gain from this? Like, what is, what do you want them to take out of the black yeah. school? We want people to take away that they can impact their own environment. We want people to walk away feeling like um, activists, leaders are not just the people that we study during Black History Month, but that they are all of us and that we're all agents of change for um, the kind of world that we want to see. Okay, hi, my name is Iksa and I'm from the Bronx Museum Teen Summer Program and I'm here with Amy Koshpin. What's up? So could you tell me a little more background about yourself? Sure. So I'm an interdisciplinary artist as well as a candidate for city council in District 39 oh, okay. running for office. I also am a comedian and a rapper and I use a lot of different practices in my art.
So just recently, I did a campaign speech at the Whitney Museum, and it was amazing because it was not only a campaign speech, but then it transformed into a rap piece, a rap performance, and I had some backup dancers come on stage, and then we were all singing and dancing together. And it was a way of creating energy for people to feel motivated and empowered. And I just feel like that's something that needs to be more merged with the political world to get people active, to keep people interested and engaged in their communities. There are different ways to talk politically. Not everyone wants to hear, like, I think when I was talking about city council, everyone was asleep. So <laughs> not everyone wants to talk about politics that way. So it's another strategy or inroad to get people interested to have these dialogues. And that's the way that I use it in my work, a big way one project in particular is The Myth of Layla, which I did, and it's crazy. I created this alternate reality where a reality show host was president, and I wrote it in 2015 before Donald Trump was even elected. Your project, Bird on the Street, um, I'm just going to ask, like, what is that about, and what is your main focus for it? Cool. Um, so Word on the Street is this project that I did around the 2017 Women's March, actually. Okay. So the banner that you're seeing behind us mm -hmm. is a big banner that I made in collaboration with this poet called Ann Carson. Okay. And so she gave me the quote. Now the quote is interesting because it's from Antigone and it's from 451 BC and it says, I was born for love, not hatred. We took it out into the street and we marched with it and then what was crazy is a curator from Times Square Arts and from the Watermill Center saw it and was like, hey, can we expand this project? Mm -hmm. And I was like, yes. We're subverting the advertising space mm -hmm. with the language of resistance. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's in a place where you wouldn't expect it. Yeah.